Alleged dissatisfaction with the welfare system causes riots in the ghetto district of Boston's Roxbury section. Stores were smashed, burned, and looted in three nights of violence. An angry mob estimated at 1,000 persons marched through the streets throwing rocks and bottles at police, setting buildings on fire. It's Boston's first full-scale riot since the start of national racial tension. Police were not the only target for hoodlums. One rooftop sniper wounded a fireman while he fought the flames. Over 40 persons were arrested. They'll be arraigned following a cooling off period. Boston's Mayor Collins called an emergency meeting with Negro leaders. Uneasy calm follows. because the children come from everywhere. I found that when I first came to the city, children called out from the top windows, hi, sister, hi, sister. And now they just, the, they say, wait, sister, it's to get onto the truck because it's so much fun. Sister Carol Putnam is one of the Urban Sisters task force that's trying to repaint the face of parochial school education in Boston, just as they redid the milk wagon she drives. No one speaks about it, but Roxbury had its share of black riots in 1967. Blue Hill Avenue is still not rebuilt, but Cardinal Cushing has put Father Michael F. Groton into an urban planning center, working on new low-cost federal housing, narcotics, and a variety of other Catholic-initiated programs for the inner city. One big issue, of course, is education. When we try to uh, examine where the parochial schools and in the city are going, it's very difficult to determine their future from a number of points of view. We, we are faced with, with the fact, for the first time in the major, major urban areas of the country, of a school that now serves uh, 
not, quote, its own in the usual sense of parochial schools for parochial, for Catholic uh, students. And this uh, really demands that we rethink the very role of the church in society. One of the Roxbury experiments in education was the turnover of a formerly Catholic school to the black community. The new Highland Park Free School, part of the Hawthorne House Community Center, became completely secular and the nuns sought service elsewhere in the field of education. When the nuns, the sisters, moved from a Hawthorne House to a residence within the community on Juniper Street, they then began to ask uh, what had they learned about the Roxbury community, about its needs for urban education that ought now to be used as, as good experience to reorient the parochial schools in the city, which in many ways uh, suffered from the same kinds of insensitivity and unpreparedness as public schools to an emerging urban and ghetto population. We, as a task force, began our work in July of last year, and we were funded by the Cardinal to do work in three areas. They were chiefly the city and the schools to update the quality of work in the city schools and to relate to the community but also to work in the fringe area around the inner city, the blue collar, threatened Irish Catholic area in which there were people who felt their jobs could be taken away or their property taken away, and in which many members of the black community were saying to us, work, work among your own, work among teaching sisters. So we have tried to develop positive attitudes in the fringe area. That uh, proposal was developed to have a staff of sisters and community people who, who could work well in four or five of the central parochial schools in the city to begin to tie the community parents, the parents of students, in much more closely with the school itself, to begin to look more critically at the type of curricula that was being used in the school, and also to develop, through this task force, the kinds of new alliances between suburban teachers, suburban students, and communities, and the urban area. Obviously, it wasn't only the church that was taking a new look at parochial schools. Mrs. Abram Clements has three daughters in parochial schools. Paula goes to Cardinal Cushing High School in Roxbury. Susan and Christina are bridge students who are bused to suburban parochial schools, a project of the Urban Sisters Task Force. But baby sister Michelle goes to the Highland Park Free School, which has given the whole family a different feeling about the schools they attend. Well, for the most part, uh, the girls have been in parochial school. They've been in parochial school for over 11 years. And I really looked at it as being one step away from heaven. I felt it was just about the most perfect place to have my children in uh, the school system here in Roxbury. So I never really argued the point with any of the sisters for a very long time. I only became more aware of what education was all about when I became involved in the Highland Park Free School. And uh, from that point on, I began to reevaluate just what ki kinds of an education they were getting in the school. I mean, in back of my mind, I really knew, you know, just what they were getting, but I felt it was the best that they could get at the time. And if my children were the very best behaved little girls that they could possibly be, they would get the very best attention. And of course, this works, you know. And of course, if mother tries to involve herself with the plays and make sure she comes to all the, in the meetings, even though you don't participate because there's nothing to participate in, you have no say so over any kinds of uh, planning that takes place, unless you want to make a cake for a cake sale or contribute to a bazaar or sell the most raffle tickets. And this is as far as your involvement goes within the parochial system. And I think it's an alien idea that must stop or the schools will stop. Millie Clements and her children express a changing involvement in education and specifically their own parochial school experiences. Like right now in high school, I have a religion course that I have to take and I'm not getting anything out of it whatsoever. We don't do any discussing, we just do it strictly from the book. And it's something that I've had ever since I was in grammar school. It was some saints day. And a white girl, she stood up and asked to pray for our aunt. And then when I stood up and said, um, you know, asked to pray for my grandfather because he was in the hospital, the sister up and said, amen. 
and everybody sat down. I had three, three white kids in my eighth grade class, and there were 46 of us. And they always seemed to pick the white kids for parts in the plays that were most important. Like when we did our Christmas pageant, the, the white kids were always Mary, and the, the black kids were always the shepherds or the kings or something like that. Or Mary Magdalene. No. We hear more and more when we begin to work in parochial schools with a majority of the students not being Catholic that there is no place for, for religious training. And I think this is a question that uh, there really needs a great deal of debate, a good deal of discussion, and, and certainly some very drastically different answers, although I don't think there might be only one answer to it. Mrs. Frank Seagraber has had eight of her ten children go to Roxbury parochial schools, and she notices changes in religious teaching. Well, I have two girls attending St. Joseph's in the grammar school. The fifth grade has a nun as a teacher. They are not teaching religion in that class. And the fourth grade, which another one of my daughters is in, has a lay woman as a teacher. She is not a Catholic. I don't re recall right now what... Uh, Protestant denomination she is. She is teaching Catholic religion to them. Oh, I think that is something. <laughs> I'm not against it, of course, but uh, I mean, you can't say just because they're in parochial school, they're getting religious instruction. Sister Loretta Ann is principal of St. John's Parochial School, one of four picked for experimental changes in curriculum. I've been here for 25 years, and during this time I've seen a great change in this district and in the school. In the beginning years, uh, we had uh, Irish and Italian families in the school, and now 95% of them are black children. And a majority of them are not even nominally Catholic. So the sisters are trying to adjust their religious teaching to this new situation. In our religious uh, teaching program, uh, it has a great deal to do with uh, situations in life. The book we follow has a great deal to do with teaching the child uh, the dignity of human life and how they should be able to get along with other people and other uh, religions. Girls, let's try that dance again, please. Swaying a little more to the right and no, make it come alive this time. All right, a lot more life. Ready? Sister Elizabeth, the teacher, has the children look up the different aspects of African culture in books and magazines. They collected pictures and also wrote poems about the African people and made authentic dashiki costumes with African materials brought back by a Peace Corps worker. The student body of St. John's parochial school is transient. Perhaps 70 students transfer in and as many leave each year. To try to bring them up to grade, the Urban Sisters Task Force has brought in teacher's aides, such as Mrs. Joan Grace, who is helping these boys with their reading. Her aiding also includes sandwich making, taking out splinters, telephoning parents, and occasionally rushing a child to the hospital. We have attempted to give the teachers as many supportive services as we could. Uh, there were two neighborhood people working in each school, assisting the teachers. Uh, we had help from many of the college students in the area uh, in art and uh, home ec and uh, things that would help in the uh, classroom situations. The, one of our most important uh, efforts has been in trying to uh, change attitudes and to help the uh, schools become more a part of the community. In September, when we asked the sisters what they felt the children really needed in the school, they all, in one accord, felt that we, they needed guidance services, which we're not able to get. So I was able to get eight students from uh, Boston University who are doing, were doing practice counseling, and they were able to go into the schools and at least interview the youngsters and, in some cases, follow it up. Then, uh, you might say, we have a new dream that the community has asked us to help develop. They asked if these schools could be used as a training ground for young black men to become teachers. And so we're beginning to collaborate with the local universities where young people from the community will go to college. We're starting off with 25 young interns. Perhaps there will be a, a few Orientals from the South End to go into the school we have in the South End, some Spanish-speaking people, 
but chiefly young black people and young men, so that the young people in the schools will have adult models whom they can look up to and want to uh, imitate in their own lives. It means looking at what should be education. Perhaps it should have an entirely different focus, that the manipulative skills may be the channel in which to come into learning instead of arithmetic or words, the words in a book. We may end up by reading, but the way one gets to reading may be through something as simple as gardening, because we found that the kids really respond to tactile experiences and should be approached perhaps in several, from de several different directions. One of the ways that Sister Carol approached education with these eighth grade boys at St. Francis de Sales parochial school was to enlist them to help make a school library, which up until their efforts had been just another drab classroom. Sister Carol made an arrangement with a local paint store to let the boys pick whatever paint they needed to give the library the required soul. An art teacher helped them work it out. One of the things, you know, that you have to get over is your fear of the material, you know? Because, like, that's a tremendous hindrance in doing what you want to do. I think what it takes is time, which you don't have that much of since you're just doing this right away, you know? Um, I don't know, but you have gotten the feeling of it. I can see some, you know, right from where you've begun. The lines are smoother. The rest of the school is quite proud of their new library, although it still is rather short on books. The bright decor doesn't seem to distract the children working there with a community teaching aid. Father, do go to school. Gee, asked Carmen. What does your father do at his school? Well, today he has to jump out of the window, said Jean. Carmen looked at Arthur. Arthur looked at Carmen. That's crazy. They said at last. What's crazy? Asked Jack. Common said. Jean says that her father goes to school. That's not crazy. Brother Martin Carter, a Franciscan brother of atonement, gives sex education classes to eighth grade boys and girls, in line with their efforts to bring as many black males into the school as they can. I think most people today would acknowledge that education is on the rocky edge because it hasn't satisfied the needs of growing people. They do not face society equipped to face it, and they ask many questions, and they are alienated. And in order to take a good, healthy look at what is going on and to plan for the future, we can't run parallel to the current public school system, which is what the parochial schools have ordinarily done. They cannot merely echo what is taking place in the public schools, they must instead be a catalytic group. And we look on the small network of schools that we're working with as just this sort of nucleus, a vital group of schools in the community, ready to listen to the needs of the community, ready to serve, ready to phase into whatever kind of category of school uh, in which administration or teaching or whatever role the community wants to take we have a sister coming in, and that will be primarily her uh, duty will be to really organize the community and try to really get the people involved in the school. And then I think they'll reach a point themselves, as happened with us at Hawthorne House, when the time comes, you just seem to know this is the time when the people assume the responsibility for the, the property and for what happens there. These experimental programs are partially supported by a parish sharing throughout the Boston Diocese. It's voluntary on both individual and parish level, but has contributed greatly to the Roxbury experiments. We've had urban-suburban exchanges with adults. We have a roster of speakers from the black community. And out of this has developed a leadership speech program for young people from the black community. They found that they were uncomfortable in front of a mic. They weren't articulate about the subjects that they were interested in and wanted to defend. And now we have several young people from the community, young black leader, who is training them in a leadership speech program. And one of the first topics for their debate uh, is, uh, can the white man have soul? One of the young people who takes part in these suburban-urban exchanges is Millie Clements' oldest daughter, Paula. They gave their first talks at Cardinal Cushing High School, where Paula is one of 20 black students in a school of 860. In 
At first, all the parents called up and complained. They said that black students should be, shouldn't be allowed to voice themselves because we might start trouble. And they actually thought that we were going to take over the school and, you know, get all black teachers in and stuff like that. And, you know, it was really crazy because we couldn't even voice our opinions without being misjudged. So we gave the assembly and it went over well. And we made a lot more friends than we would have if we didn't give the assembly because they didn't understand us and they were afraid of us. And right now, you know, it's really worked out well. And we have a lot of kids that, you know, really like us because we're people and not because they have to because they're afraid of us. And, you know, the last few months we've been going out to suburban schools and it was for a weekend and we talked to white adults and white teenagers and after this confrontation we had invited about 15 white kids to come out to Roxbury to see Roxbury and you know just see what it was like you know because everybody thought that people went around stabbing people and robbing stores and you know we wanted to show them the beautiful things in Roxbury and so we had 15 kids that wanted to come out and only three came because the parents wouldn't allow them to come out because they didn't want them to get hurt or we'd kill them or some stuff like that. They didn't trust us at all and they didn't trust Roxbury. But the three kids that did come out went back to Stoneham with good news and a lot's changed since then. We have the Boys Club and we've got a lot of new supermarkets like Freedom Foods and I think just now more black people are linking together, you know, as brothers and sisters, you know. Like before, if you walked down the street and said hi to somebody, you'd get looked at like you were crazy, but now it's different. You know, like you can say, you know, you can say hello to a brother and you can get a response and it makes you feel warm inside that, you know, you and your people are really moving on up all together. Part of the beautification of Roxbury are these murals by well-known black artists. Not all of the feelings expressed are as warm and friendly as Paula's. Another part of the program of the Urban Sisters Task Force is Bridge, which is busing black children from Roxbury out to the suburbs, to 60 suburban white parochial schools and five private schools in and around Boston. Sister Sheila Finnegan explains that they are not in the business of busing for integration's sake. The reason that we bus children out of Roxbury neighborhood is not because we don't believe in neighborhood schools. Everyone who is involved in a busing program is, is a great believer in the, the idea of a neighborhood school. Most of the parents who uh, bring their children to us to be bused, if you ask them what was their preference, their preference would be to have their kids going to school near them where they could come home and have regular play hours and regular playmates. So we're constantly being asked then, why do we play this busing game? Isn't it just tokenism to take three or four kids and put them in this white school or seven or eight and put them someplace else? And our basic reason is that knowing the Boston school system as, as it is and, and knowing the state of the Boston urban school, and that's where these kids would have to go, that it has been our decision, but more importantly, the decision of the parent who has come off the street because Bridge doesn't do any kind of formal advertising. It's by word of mouth and hearing about it from different people. They come off the street and ask for an alternative to the kind of very poor quality education that's available to their kid in the neighborhood school. And we feel that as long as they come and ask and that there is a possibility of giving an alternative, that we're there to give it. Paula Clement's sister Susan is one of the students who is bused out to parochial schools in the Boston suburbs. Um, some children may say they're benefiting by going out there, but I myself know that it's not doing any good. In fact, I'm losing because you get up at around 6 o'clock in the morning and um, you catch the bus at 7 and you don't get home till 5 o'clock. And um, while you're out there, it seems like I know in my school, work goes in one ear and goes out the other. We find in some cases, educationally, we haven't put them in a much better school. Other cases, educationally, yes, we've put them in a better school, but we've put them in the, that school when they've been two and three years behind that better school. So very often there's an educational gap with our youngsters. But I suppose the biggest gap is the social gap. And it's, it's, it's a, a two-way gap that begins to exist with our students. Not only are they only accepted on a very surface level in the schools, the white schools themselves. But when they come back home into their neighborhood, sometimes they find that a process of rejection has set in because they've gone to honky school. 
and they're teased because they come home sometimes in pro school uniforms. They come home with homework, and some of the kids around them don't have the same amount of homework. And they're accused of, in some instances, of being sellouts to the black community because they are going to school in a white community. They just don't, they don't feel comfortable. They don't work like they're comfortable in the teachers. You have prejudiced people out there. I have to always, you know, go to them and ask them. And some, most of the time when I go, you know, to ask them if I can sit with them, they say no. I don't have that many friends, you know. I interview kids, black kids that go out to suburban schools. And they think that the education that they're getting is a lot, you know, it's more important than how the kids treat them. And I think they ought to stop sending black children out there. They ought to, you know, we should work with ourselves. And if they want, they want to send, uh, they want a better education, why don't they bring some of the white children into our area and show, just show them what it's like. And maybe they'll pay attention. Sometimes the faculties of the schools are amazed that the children are not more grateful for the wonderful opportunity that they're getting because after all, they're being allowed to come into this beautiful white suburban school. They're being allowed to uh, sit down next to nice white middle-class suburban youngsters. And several times we've been told, well, the least that they can do is be grateful. But this again shows a lack of sensitivity on the part of this white faculty. That, that the last thing that the black child is going to feel toward the society that, you know, made him have to get on this bus today and made him have to go on this long ride and made him have to sit here and be at the end of all the grading in the school, be uh, the, getting the poorest report cards of the children in the school. These are the very people that are now asking him to be grateful because they've let him in and it's, it's just not going to happen. In particular, it isn't happening with the Clements family, who feel that the Highland Park Free School, a black community school which their mother helped found, has shown them something else to aim for. Because before that, we felt, I felt very tight and very afraid to move within the system that they were in. And like I said, I didn't want to shake anybody's, anybody's teacher up so that the child would, wouldn't suffer for it. That was the whole, that was the total fear. But now I'm afraid those fears, well, I'm not afraid, but I'm afraid they're afraid that those fears have dissolved. Paula will continue at Cardinal Cushing High, but Susan and Christina will join their younger sister, Michelle, at Highland Park. One, one really thing that I like about Highland Park is that there's a new breed of kids being brought up here. I mean, it's the idea that people are people. You know, because I think in my generation, there's been this thing where you're black and I'm white. And I mean, you know, like age difference. And it's more or less, you're black and I'm white, and this is the way it's got to be, so let's accept it. But these kids are brought up right away with the idea that everybody's equal. And I think it makes such a big difference. This past summer, the Urban Sisters Task Force filled the painted milk wagon with materials that would point up to children the differences in people and races. To bring out the idea that people are different and the differences are good. This broad effort to change the face of parochial education in Roxbury is unique in that perhaps it is further along than in any other community around the country. Many Catholic church schools are trying to face their own inner city crisis as well as that of the community. At the moment, there are no real answers, as Father Michael Grodden points out. It's really the whole parochial school system and its future is really in grave doubt uh, whether religious communities and the parishes that support the educational institutions in, in which they serve, uh, it's really hard to say where it's all going. The moment the diocese is involved in a, a complex and hopefully significant educational survey, uh, the results of that are, are yet to come, but what, whether the survey shows we can run 10 schools or 100 schools, the church itself has to stop and say, where are we to be in the field of education? Maybe it would be a courageous decision to say we ought not to run any school. Maybe it would be much more creative to say we should only be in education in those places where we can do a better job or do a job that's not being done. And long range, it's very hard to determine the, the future of the church in education and the financial burden that uh, realistically in, in some respects we really are no longer able to shoulder. It forces in many ways the church to 
re-examine its role not only in the city, but I personally believe that the role of the church in the city is a microcosm of the church's role in the world community today. That is that we are a minority and we are a diminishing minority that Yves Congar, the French theologian, describes as the minority whose task it is to serve the majority. All men are not called, perhaps, to the church, but rather to the way of life that the Lord has designed for men to live in justice and in right. And uh, I think that when we try to appreciate more clearly that role, that position of the church as the minority serving the majority in a very selfless way, not asking where new members are coming from, how are we going to fill our churches, but be quite satisfied and uh, in a way uh, quite elated that we are simply to be a minority that attempts to, to serve a community without any kind of uh, hope of return. CBS News has presented Look Up and Live. Today, the conclusion of the Roxbury experiments. Reports on reform and revolution in inner city parochial schools.